Now let's look at two major consequences or predictions of the theory of general relativity. The first is the idea of black holes. Stars hide your fires, let not light see my dark and deep desires. Perhaps Shakespeare was anticipating black holes in this scene in Macbeth. In fact, the early ideas of black holes came long before Einstein. But they were using Newton's gravity and essentially pushing it past the breaking point. It was realized by several people, John Mitchell in 1783, a pastor who did physics in his spare time, and Pierre Laplace, a mathematician in 1796, it was realized that a star large enough or dense enough might have an escape velocity equal to that of light just by extrapolating its properties. And you see here in the diagram that the Earth has an escape velocity. An object launched at 10 kilometers per second, or less than 11 kilometers per second, will fall back to the Earth. At 11 kilometers per second, the object leaves forever. If the Earth were made 100 times smaller, which is a million times denser, then that escape velocity goes up to 110 kilometers per second. And we can imagine a situation where the Earth was squashed to a third of an inch, and at that point, formally, the escape velocity would be 300,000 kilometers per second. That's the speed of light. That means that light could not escape an object that dense, if now that object is a star. So this was the thought process by which Mitchell and Laplace imagined that stars might somehow trap light and so be dark stars. However, in 1800, soon after, Thomas Young showed that light was wave properties, as opposed to Newton's idea that it was a corpuscle. And nobody really understood physically how light could be trapped by gravity whereas it was easy to imagine how a particle could be trapped by gravity. So the idea of dark stars elapsed pretty much for 200 years. Black holes are predicted by general relativity, but Einstein actually thought they were a mathematical artifact. He didn't think they were real, as did other famous astrophysicists like Arthur Eddington. But the theory was worked out about how stars die, and it was recognized in the 1930s and 1940s that when a massive star exhausts its fuel, if the core is more than three times the sun's mass, then no known force can resist an eventual contraction to a state where not even light can escape. And so black holes were predicted as the endpoints of star formation. You can see in the diagram here that low mass stars never get that dense and compact and they leave behind white dwarfs. That's the fate of the sun. Larger mass stars initially about 10 times the mass of the sun, leave a compact core that is the density of nuclear matter. That's a neutron star. But even more massive stars, those that say started at 20 times the mass of the sun, will leave behind a core that's three or four or five times the mass of the sun where the gravity is so strong that nothing can escape, and that's a black hole. Now the prediction of black holes came as a byproduct of physicists who were working on states of condensed matter. It was Robert Oppenheimer, Hans Bethe, and in fact, it was a byproduct of their technical work for the Manhattan Project and the development of the atomic bomb in the early 1940s. But by the mid-1940s, the prediction was out there by the theorists working on stellar collapse that black holes should exist in the universe when a dead star dies. In the theory, black holes are very simple objects. In fact, they really only have a couple of properties. They're characterized by their mass, and since stars are always rotating and when they collapse their spin rate will increase, they're going to have an angular momentum. So a black hole is characterized by its mass, its size, and its spin. Now what does size mean for a black hole? The size is defined by the event horizon, which is a boundary defining the region from which no light or matter can escape. And it's important to realize that in the theory this is not a physical surface. It's an information barrier. It's not as if you entered a black hole and you'd hit something or go bump at the event horizon. The event horizon simply marks the boundary between things that we can see in the universe we live in and things that can never be revealed to us or we can never see because they're in a region where not even light can escape. The black hole theory also predicts something called a singularity, which is a central point of infinite mass density. And that's a problem in the theory, and was known to be right from the beginning. Because infinite mass density in any physical theory uh, means something's wrong with the theory. 
Uh, that's a nonsensical idea that mass density be infinite, but that's indeed what the theory predicts. Stephen Hawking put it this way, that the black hole theory contains the seeds of its own demise. So this was telling theorists, even back in the 30s and 40s, that the black hole theory, while understanding that there might be an object from which nothing could escape, was not complete enough to fully understand black hole properties. And that's still actually the case. How did we find black holes? Well, it took a couple of decades. An isolated black hole would be invisible. But most stars are in binary systems. The sun is slightly unusual. About two-thirds of all stars are either in systems with another companion or more than one companion. And so many stars and massive stars will die in a binary system. In that situation, the black hole can siphon gas off from its normal star companion. And although the black hole is invisible itself, the gas that falls into the black hole along, along the equatorial plane, and so in a disk called an accretion disk, will heat up to temperatures of millions of degrees and it will glow in x-rays. And that, of course, was the prediction that people needed to find these in the real universe. And so after a lot of work in the 1960s, in 1974, the brightest x-ray source in the constellation Cygnus, Cygnus X1, was confirmed with very difficult observations to be a binary system with a dark companion had the mass such that it must be a black hole. So this work actually took the invention of X-ray astronomy in the late 1960s to be able to find X-ray sources because the X-ray sources are the telltales of a black hole in a binary system heating up gas by drawing it off its companion. In the time since then, about 50 of these binary systems has been found. It's not that many for half a century of work. So black holes are hard to find. It's hard to get this level of data. They're also rare. Only one in a thousand stars will die as a black hole because most stars are not massive. They're stars like the sun or even less massive. So it's the small tail of very massive stars who have the capability to die as a black hole, meaning they're rare, meaning the closest examples are actually hundreds of light years away. On the right at the top, we see an animation of the glowing accretion disk and the jets of plasma that are supposed to be ejected from the poles of the black hole. Again, the black hole itself is at the center of this little animation and invisible and dark, but the region close to the black hole is full of extremely hot gas and high energy radiation, and that's what lets us see it. Now, if we could swoop down into the interior of this hot gas and go very close to the event horizon and the gas very close to it, we'd see the animated sequence on the lower right. These distortions of the light are from a system that's actually a disk of gas glowing. And all the distortions and wrappings are caused by the gravitational deflection and lensing of light. This is showing the extraordinary gravitational optics of the event horizon and the region very close to a black hole. <laughs> And now we enter Stephen Hawking's world. Space-time is almost impossible to contemplate because our entire sensory existence is limited to the three dimensions of everyday experience. Holy macaroni! The easiest way for us to enter Einstein's universe is to imagine space and time to be like a sheet of rubber. If space-time were empty, the deep would be flat. But massive bodies like the Earth and Sun will bend the deep and cause it to be curved. This curvature is Einstein's concept of gravity. The more mass a star or planet has, the more steeply it bends space-time around it, and so the more gravity it has. Throw something extremely heavy, like a collapsing star, onto the sheet, and you soon end up with a universe full of holes. Ow! Watch it, Cody! Oops. As the massive star pools and shrinks, it will curve the space-time around it more and more. Eventually, when it shrinks to a certain critical size, 
that will quite literally create a black hole in space-time. Things can fall into a black hole, but nothing can get out. Oh, there's so much I don't know about astrophysics. I wish I read that book by that wheelchair guy. <laughs> The most terrifying concept in astrophysics lurks at the bottom of a black hole, the singularity. Everything that has ever fallen into the hole is destroyed at the singularity, crushed into a pinpoint of infinite density and infinite smallness. Even space and time are squelched out of existence. All that remains in the outside universe is a perfect sphere of absolute darkness, a gravitational ghost of the star that died. This sphere is called the event horizon, and it marks the edge of the abyss. As you saw in that little montage of animations, Stephen Hawking is in Einstein's level of celebrity. He was a very famous scientist that went into the popular imagination for several reasons. One, just his sheer brilliance in the subject of black holes and gravity and cosmology. Also, the tragedy of his life. He was afflicted by ALS, or Lou Gehrig's disease. When he was a graduate student at age 21, Hawking was given two years to live. ALS, when it comes to someone in their 20s, usually progresses rapidly, and they don't last long. Instead, he lived another 50 years to a ripe old age and died only a couple of years ago. Now he's what buried in Westminster Abbey alongside his hero, Isaac Newton. So Hawking was a celebrity physicist of his time, perhaps the most famous physicist since Einstein, and he made seminal contributions to black holes and many subjects. He also was a great popularizer of science. His book, a Brief History of Time, was translated into two dozen languages and sold millions of copies although it's not actually that easy a read. What did Hawking do that made him so famous? And how did he revolutionize the idea of black holes, which had been known for some time? The first insight he had was that black holes are not actually black. There is a phenomenon in physics called virtual particle-antiparticle pair creation. That's a little esoteric. But basically, from the vacuum of space, it's known that particles and antiparticles can appear and disappear spontaneously and as long as they disappear in a tiny, tiny fraction of a second, energy conservation can be violated for a very short time. So this is a well-known phenomenon, and it's observed in the lab and has been for decades. Hawking realized that this would happen in space, too, and he did the calculation to show that if particle-antiparticle -particle pair creation occurred near the event horizon of a black hole, there was a finite chance that one member of the pair would be inside the event horizon and the other outside. Depending on whether it's a particle or an antiparticle, the net result is the loss of a particle or the loss of a little energy from the black hole. And so, because this energy has been taken, remember, from the vacuum of space, so when it's emitted, it's a net loss to the black hole. They're both equivalent. So black holes are predicted, in Hawking's theory, to radiate, and they will eventually lose enough mass that they evaporate. This phenomenon is called Hawking radiation. And it means that black holes have another property beyond mass, size, and spin. They have a temperature. The temperature is tiny. For a dead star black hole, it's about a billionth of a Kelvin, which is completely unmeasurable. Hawking was very disappointed by the low level of Hawking radiation because he recognized that if it had been detected by astronomers, he probably would have won a Nobel Prize, which he never did. So Hawking radiation has never been observed, but it's a clear prediction of the theory. The other consequence, that black holes, by losing energy and therefore mass, are slowly evaporating, means that black holes are not eternal, as we imagined they were before Hawking. The evaporation rate is also incredibly small or slow. And so a star like a black hole that's the death of a star like the sun would last 10 to the power 68 years. That's a one with 68 zeros before it fully evaporates in a crescendo of Hawking radiation to nothing. And so the evaporation rate has also not been observed. So this is interesting. Hawking's made some very profound predictions. The black holes are not eternal. They're not black. They have temperature. They emit radiation. 
These things have not been experimentally confirmed, but people still think the theory is correct. They found no reason for it not to be. Another consequence of Hawking's ideas is what's called the information paradox. Black holes actually have a lot of entropy or disorder. You can think of this in several ways. First of all, any information that falls into them is lost because nothing can get out. They are just black or opaque. For example, in a trivial example, imagine you made a black hole by throwing a lot of books into it or squashing books into a black hole state. Well, all the information, literal information in those books would be lost forever. Well, that's a trivial example, but in a physics sense, they also contain disorder or entropy. And that's back to Boltzmann's definition of the number of equivalent microscopic states. In other words, since a black hole is mute to how it was made, it doesn't tell you which of the many possible equivalent internal states it sits in, as opposed to a specific macroscopic object like a star or a supernova or a white dwarf, where you can learn about the physical state. And so formally, black holes have a lot of entropy. In fact, mathematically, a black hole, the mass of the sun, has 100 million times the entropy of the star, the sun. And so entropy is quite a big deal for black holes. However, the problem here is that quantum theory, our well-established theory of microscopic particle interactions, says that information in particle interactions should be perfectly preserved, forward and backward in time, and you should always be able to retrieve the information of the initial state from the final state. And that's a big problem because the black hole conceals the eventual state, and so that information is lost too. So this conflict between gravity and the theory of general relativity not being consistent with a foundational prediction of quantum theory is the information paradox. Now really, the information paradox is telling us something that's been known for a while, which is our theory of black holes is not complete. The singularity is another example of the fact that black hole theory is not complete because we can't understand that either. Physicists have spent a lot of time developing possible answers to the information paradox. One clever idea is that as matter falls in asymptotically its clock slowing down to infinitely slow and so we see matter falling in and taking an infinite amount of time to reach the event horizon. Perhaps the information that falls into a black hole is somehow coded onto the event horizon as it falls in. And this is called the holographic principle. That's turning a black hole event horizon into a, an enormous two-dimensional hologram. So the holographic principle escapes the conclusion that the information is lost because it's simply encoded on the event horizon and we'd have to figure out a way to uncode it. Or, alternatively, the particle correlations that are predicted by quantum theory might somehow be destroyed. And that's led to the hypothesis of a region called a firewall that destroys this information just outside the event horizon. Well, no firewall has been observed and no means of extracting information from the event horizon has been found. And so these are pure speculations from theory. So decades after their first prediction by Einstein and decades after the first black holes were discovered, they remain a rich topic for speculation and for theorizing. Also, Astronomers have found that black holes exist at a different mass scale entirely from a dead star. Nature apparently knows how to make black holes that range all the way from a few times the mass of the sun, dead star corpses, to 10 or 20 billion times the mass of the sun, huge behemoths in the centers of galaxies, with every galaxy containing a massive black hole. As I said, only 50 or so black holes have been measured in binary systems the dead star corpses. The nearest is a few hundred light years away, and most of them are a few thousand light years away. They project to a number like 10 million across the entire Milky Way galaxy. With a lot of work, astronomers have also found intermediate mass black holes of 1,000 or 10,000 times the mass of the sun. These sit at the center of the densest, most massive star clusters we know of, called globular clusters, that orbit in the Milky Way halo. And there is a 4 million solar mass black hole in the center of our galaxy. And its evidence, the evidence for it has gotten so good that it's actually the best known black hole in the universe at this point. There's even speculation that early in the history of the universe, soon after the Big Bang, the intense roiling gravity and curved space-time might have created microscopic or miniature black holes, 
small fraction of the mass of a star or a planet. Now many of these black holes would have evaporated if Hawking radiation is a correct prediction, but some could have survived into the present day universe. And these are called primordial black holes. So that's a, a possible prediction from cosmology of a type of black hole that we haven't yet observed. So black holes is a rich research topic because there are black holes large and small and speculation about tiny black holes. In my research, I've worked on supermassive black holes, which are the black holes that we find at the centers of galaxies. In this image on the left, we see the way the Hubble Space Telescope was able, soon after its launch, a few decades ago, to take pictures, or spectra, of the nuclei of nearby galaxies. So on the left, you see a slit of a spectrograph dropped across a dusty elliptical galaxy. You see the smooth distribution of stars and the raggedy dust lane. In the slit of the spectrograph, we can disperse the light from the stars in the center of the galaxy. And that dispersed light is the spectrum color-coded on the right. And we can see that the velocity shifts, the Doppler shifts of the stars right near the center of the galaxy, in the middle of that image, are extreme. High blue shifts and high red shifts. And then they get smaller as you go further out. That range from low red shift to high red shift of Doppler shifts of stars near the center of a galaxy can be converted into a mass of the center of the galaxy. And that calculation shows that this galaxy and other galaxies like it have very massive black holes in their centers. Masses of tens, hundreds of thousands of light of black hole masses times the sun or millions of masses of the sun or even billions. So these rapid Doppler motions have been seen in every nearby galaxy we look at. The black holes themselves are not active or luminous, so if we just stared at the galaxy or took a picture of it, we'd see nothing special. And so we deduce from this work that black holes do have fueling episodes when they're very bright, but those fueling episodes are about 1% of their lifetime, episodically and randomly, and most of the time they're not active. When supermassive black holes are active or fueling, they become the brightest objects in the universe. A region solar system sized outshining a galaxy by a factor of a thousand. And that's the object we call a quasar in astronomy. How important are black holes in the composition of the universe? Here's a pie chart of what the universe is made of. And you can see that most of the universe is made of two enigmatic contents, dark matter and dark energy. We'll talk about them later. Normal matter, the stuff that we're made of, and the content of all the stars and in all the galaxies in the universe is about 5%. And you can see here that in the pie chart, the black holes in the universe, which is either the dead star corpses in every galaxy or the massive black holes that every galaxy has at its center, they only add up to five thousandths of a percent of the pie chart of the universe. That is to say they're one thousandths of the normal atomic mass or molecular mass of a galaxy, one part in a thousand. So although black holes loom large in the popular imagination, the idea that they're going to eat everything up or consume the universe, their cosmic vacuum cleaners, is pretty much wrong. Black holes are rare, and they actually don't amount to a large fraction of what the universe is made of. It is worth looking, though, at the issue of death by black hole, which is in the popular imagination. What would be the result of falling into a black hole? Well, people have written about this. People have written books about this. Falling into a black hole that resulted from a massive star's death would be undoubtedly one of the worst ways to die. The technical term is spaghettification. And what that means is that you would be stretched, whether you fall feet first in or head first or sideways. Your body would be pulled apart at the level of muscles, bones, tissues, and molecules. The tidal forces would rip you apart at every dimension. However, luckily, they're rare. Only one in a thousand stars die this way, so the nearest black hole that you might fall into and die this way is hundreds of light years away. Nothing to worry about. And it's also worth remembering that black holes do not suck up everything around them. They only distort space-time and create these extreme effects quite close to the event horizon. It's a very small region of space. Intriguingly, if we do the calculation, as a, ma a black hole gets more massive, its total gravity, of course, increases, but its tidal force, or stretching force, is more modest. And if you do the math, above a thousand times the mass of the sun, you could survive passage into that black hole because you would fall in, the gravity is strong,
but the stretching force would probably make you uncomfortable, but it wouldn't rip you apart. And there are plenty of massive black holes bigger than this, center of every galaxy, and there's probably a few inglobular clusters that may be a few thousand light years away. What would that experiment look like? Well, as seen from afar, time would slow down asymptotically, so you would appear to be immortalized or memorialized at the event horizon, taking an infinite amount of time to reach the event horizon. But from your perspective, you would enter to an unknown fate passing through the event horizon and not, of course, be able to tell the tale because no information can get out. And that's the end of this topic.